In today's episode, we have Dr. Olufemi Ogusoya. Dr. Olufemi Ogusoya is a former lecturer at the University of Lagos and she's the founder of the Oxbridge Tutorial College. Founded in 1993, Oxbridge was the first sixth form college in the country and remains the premier specialist sixth form college based in Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Ogusoya is also the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Association of Private Educators in Nigeria, APEN. She is the chairman of the Lagos Anglican Schools Management Board and the chairman of the Gobi College in Yaba. Dr. Ogusoya also sits on the board of Preparation for Life, which is an education consultancy outfit. Interviewing Dr. Ogusoya today, we have Ayoyinka Delumo. Ayoyinka is a graduate of communications from McMaster University in Canada and the founder of Play Place. Play Place is an indoor play center that provides a fun and safe environment where children can engage in innovative and creative play. Join us as we listen to the entrepreneurship journey in the education industry. So thank you so much, Dr. Gunsaya, for your time. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I think the aim of this interview is to learn about your journey, how you got to where you are today, and to gain some useful insights for up and coming entrepreneurs on how they too can also go on this journey in this particular sector, in the education sector. So I think I'm going to jump right in, if that's okay it's with a you. Being here, thank you so this much. Conversation, and I'm sure yes. I learned from you. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. So let's take a trip down memory lane. Who was Dr. Ogunsaya growing up? <laughs> um, Dr. Ogunsaya growing up, I'm from a family of two. I have an older brother and myself, and uh, I was born then in Elisha. Uh, but I lived most of my life before going into secondary school in Ibadan. And then I went to, I attended Queen School Lady, eating in the bush for the <laughs> girls, <laughs> where we had uh, an amazing experience. The schools then were very good quality, mm -hmm. equitable to mm -hmm. public schools in the UK. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing experience of uh, having fun with the girls, with yeah. colleagues. We had expatriate teachers, both from America and the UK. And therefore, it was a very impactful experience. Right. And it's what formed a lot of us into what we, we became in later life. Okay. We even had um, phonetics. Oh, wow. I remember Mrs. Holloway was a phonetics teacher, and you had mm -hmm. to pass that as well. So a lot of the diction we also have mm -hmm. came from that background. So it was quality education in a federal government school. Oh, wow in a day in the bush. Okay. Uh, so that's my educational life growing up to that level. And then after that, I attended University of Lagos. So I'm actually yeah. made in Nigeria. Oh, wow. <laughs> I attended the University of Lagos uh, for my undergraduate program. And then proceeded to University of Bristol for my postgraduate. And uh, after graduating, I came back, lectured at Unilag for about 10 years before I then moved back to the UK again and then came back to start up with Tutorial College. So um, from what you've told me, I can see that education played a pivotal role in, in who you've become today. So did you always know that you would one day own your own college? No. Okay. Um, starting off, uh, my parents, I think, more or less decided what you should become in those days. And my father wanted me to be a medical doctor. Unfortunately, they had a friend, a medical, he's late now, a surgeon, and I went to the theatre with him once. I love children, and it was a caesarean operation. Oh, wow. So I think that traumatised me. And I just said thereafter, I didn't like the sight of blood, mm -hmm. medicine is not for me. Well, you want uh, somebody called doctor, I'll do a PhD <laughs> program. So really, I never envisaged that I'll even teach. Right. Because growing up, I was a very shy, introverted person, not very keen on public speaking. My father, on the other hand, was an orator. And um, 
So really, I did not. I was more interested in the research aspect of things rather than the speaking aspect of things. But then I found myself lecturing and I really enjoyed it. That's amazing. So how did you discover the opportunity to start um, Oxbridge? So from being a lecturer, how did you then transition to being an entrepreneur and then owning your own college? Right, the journey started when, um, you know, you wouldn't know, <laughs> uh, when Jack on Day came mm -hmm. in, I think, as mm -hmm. Commissioner or Minister of Education in mm -hmm. those days, yeah. and set up all these um, mushroom schools all over the place. Uh, a lot of us at that time decided to take our children out of the country. And so I took my children out of Nigeria, and that's when my lecturing stopped. I was 38 then. Mm -hmm. I left lecturing. Okay. And I went to uh, the UK with them, and I was a research fellow at the University College London. So to cut a long story short, when they, I have two children, when they grew up and went into boarding house, I then was at a loss of what to do with myself. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I could then come back to Nigeria. And that's when I started looking into what I could do. Lecturing, teaching, impacting knowledge was what I was familiar with. I actually tried to mm -hmm. dabble into, in business, mm -hmm. in trading, mm -hmm. but it's not my forte. <laughs> And I discovered, discovered that very quickly. Yeah. So I then looked into it and I said, okay, let me go into education, mm -hmm. borrowing from the experience of my children in the UK, mm -hmm. where A-levels, mm -hmm. sixth form was part of the, um, of the educational journey. And I then looked into the Nigerian market. And to be honest, there were a lot of naysayers, a lot of people who uh, would have discouraged that oh, yeah. this person has tried to do something or the other mm -hmm. but they didn't have the understanding of where I was coming from mm -hmm. and therefore I saw a niche in the market mm -hmm. in the system at that mm -hmm. time because students took their WIAC jam and mm -hmm. they didn't have their results for a whole year yeah. so I saw that as an opportunity to introduce uh, the sixth form concept into the Nigerian market at that time to catch them to actually have the opportunity to impact some knowledge into them before they actually went into university. Based on my experience of students who entered the university when I was lecturing mm -hmm. there, they came in, they partied through the whole <laughs> year more or less and just before the exams mm -hmm. they cramped and reproduced. Mm. So I thought if I was able to catch them at a younger age I would be able to impact the discipline of independent studying, not cramming, not plagiarism, address all of those issues so that they are better prepared mm. for uh, undergraduate studies. So that's how Oxford started. That's amazing. So you started this amazing business and it's go time. Can you walk me through the first year of business? Because I know personally from my own experience, the first year of business is the toughest. You're doing a lot of trial and errors. So can you walk me through the first year of Oxbridge College? Right. I came with the knowledge base of, with the vision of exactly what I wanted to achieve. Um, it was new. So we were really the first one to start the sixth yeah. form concept in Nigeria. But the first year, I remember we started on the 1st of August, 1993. And um, I got a rented um, property on mm -hmm. Jelugunaike, still within the GRA. Mm -hmm. A lot of people did not really understand what the Sixth Form College mm -hmm. concept was within the system at that time. So when we opened our gate, we were sitting, watching the gates, Anybody, once we mm. had the gate open, mm. uh, my uh, assistant and I will run out, welcome mm. them. So there was that anxiety to be able mm. to actually get people to come in for us to be able to explain uh, what we were about. Social media was not mm -hmm. in place at that time. Marketing was really just through newspaper advertisements. Mm. People would say, oh, we saw the adverts, but then they never followed up with it. So there was a challenge of recruitment, of enrollment of students. I think the first year we started with only about 20, with all the rent and all the staff in place and everything. But my own thought process always is that if you show them of what you are about and you get good results at the end of the day, 
then people will gradually buy into it. So by the within the first in the first year, it was a challenge of enrollment of students, recruitment of teachers who even understood what yeah. the A level program was about. Yeah. Because by that time, what we call higher school certificate HSC mm -hmm. in the days when we were in school had been scrapped. Mm -hmm. So people were just stopping at white level. Mm -hmm. So um, human capacity, human resource, employing people was also a problem. And then of course the challenge of the funding because of course you came in with 20 students with rent to pay with salaries to pay at the end of every month very limited income i had to go back to family to be able to get support to pay salaries in fact it was family that through family that i was able to rent the premises mm -hmm. anyway because the banks are not that friendly yeah. with the education yeah. sector so I mean I think every entrepreneur can relate to the journey that you you went through in your first year and I think it's really inspiring to see that you're here 26 years later considering the fact that you know it was such a rocky start um, in the first year and I think one of the things that you talked about was um, staff and you know hiring people that understand or that at that time understood about the sixth form and I think that's something that entrepreneurs, I myself in particular, we still struggle with today. And I know that running a, a college and um, also, you know, having so many moving parts can be difficult, especially in your sector. So how did you, how did you juggle everything? The issue of enrollment, the issue of um, staff, how did you put in a structure that was, that worked, um, you know, at such an early stage of your business? I think the uh, enrollment, because it was new in the system and because there were a lot of kids who were at home anyway, mm -hmm. word of mouth soon spread the information and parents saw it as a place where they could send their children to. Mm -hmm. And then also given the fact that the universities were not very stable mm -hmm. in those days, parents actually wanted to see what they could do to sponsor or to support their children to go abroad. Mm -hmm. So those two things helped with the enrollment. Mm -hmm. Slowly and steadily we yeah. got more and more people. Some people even left the universities because there was a lot of closure mm -hmm. of universities at that time to do the A-levels so that they could go abroad even after mm -hmm. first year of the, uh, the undergraduate program. So that helped. Once the information got into the public mm -hmm. space, people got to see the benefit, the advantage, mm -hmm. and it worked well with what was going on in the um, uh, in the space in the public at that time as well with the government's closure mm -hmm. of universities and everything. Mm -hmm. With the staff, the lucky thing is that, and I do say I am lucky, mm -hmm. that some staff who started with me then are still in my system wow. today, 26 years on, because I believe a lot in training. So continuous professional development is essential mm. for people to be able to buy into your vision, number one, mm -hmm. for people to be able to understand the expectations mm. of the uh, school or the institution that was set up as well. Mm. So we do a lot of trainings within and outside Nigeria, school visits outside mm. Nigeria, attending conferences outside Nigeria, so that slowly and steadily people got to understand better the expectations of the um, sixth, form. sixth form college. And then also partnering with um, other uh, institutions abroad yeah. so that they would then come in, do some training for the staff as well, um, help us with the curriculum to yeah. um, understand things better. So slowly and steadily, people got to understand the expectations and they learned on the job as well. And that's what has helped in uh, ensuring a stability within the system. I think that's amazing. A lot of entrepreneurs are scared to train you or you hear them saying, what if I invest in this person and the person leaves? But I think, um, like you mentioned, I think that's something I will personally take away that you should invest in the people um, that are working with you and for you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you mentioned was funding and mm -hmm. you said you were able to gain funding from your friends and family, or should I say family? family. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so what would your advice be for an up and coming entrepreneur that's looking for funding, but doesn't have a family member to fall back on and specifically wants to go into the, the education sector? What, what would advice would you give them? 
Um, number one, wanting to go into the education sector, there must be a lot of preparation. You must have a crisp and clear vision. And you must also be able to look into the market and see what will be unique mm -hmm. about whatever it is you are trying to introduce into the market space. And then for funding, um, small business, SMEs, uh, the banks have that now, some yeah. banks have that, and the um, central bank also has some yeah. that they disbursed mm -hmm. through banks yeah. as well. That would be the place to go. Unfortunately, the interest rates can be crippling. So even yeah. in going into such into the banks or into the into um, getting a loan, mm -hmm. one should not be over ambitious in the amount mm -hmm. that you collect. And you must do your homework. You must look at your feasibility yeah. studies properly, mm -hmm. your projections, and ensure you are able to meet up with the repayments. Yeah. Repayment is very very key mm -hmm. because. Uh, one million can become 10 million before you know it if mm -hmm. one is not sticking mm -hmm. to the repayment plan. So one must study the business, whatever business, whatever school, the be it a nursery, primary, be it a crash, be it a secondary school or whatever, and do professional projections. Get professional people to work with okay. one and do a proper projection and see there for the income mm -hmm. and how the income can sustain the loans that can be obtained. I think that's and then also friends. I'll say also try friends. Look for investors mm -hmm. if it's possible because that's a better route to go than the bank. Yes. Because investors promise them even if it's 5% mm -hmm. on their investment, return on their investment. Mm -hmm. So at least it's not just a case of taking the money, spending yeah. it and then just giving them back. So at least they then know that there's something in it. Yeah. Sell mm -hmm. some shares. Yeah. within the organization, mm -hmm. within the company, within the school, mm -hmm. if possible. But you know, before going down the route of uh, selling shares, try, mm -hmm. try friends, look for investors, have a functional board of governors mm -hmm. who can advise, who can direct, mm -hmm. who can direct, have a very, very experienced finance person on mm -hmm. that board who can then mm -hmm. lead you to investors as well. That's amazing. So uh, you, you've been on an interesting journey from 1993 till now. So let's fast forward to present day. How has Oxbridge evolved from a college with 20 students to what it is today? Um, one of my strategy, I call it my strategy of running a business, mm -hmm. is that annually there must be something new of added value. Mm -hmm. So Oxbridge started off as a sixth form college um, about five years down the line or three or four years down the line, mm -hmm. I came across somebody who was interested in coming to Nigeria to work as a consultant agent um, for progression from schools mm -hmm. to schools abroad. So agents, they call them consult educational agents, consultant mm -hmm. agents. I partnered with him because that again I brought into the uh, Oxford space mm -hmm. as something new of mm -hmm. um, interest so that our students, our parents could have yeah. somebody who could serve as an agent yeah. for the progression of their children to mm -hmm. universities and schools abroad. A bit further down the line we also partnered with an, a delivery uh, mm -hmm. agent uh, called the NCUK. Uh, they are the agent for about 17 um, universities in the Midlands in the wow. UK and they were looking for a place to deliver their syllables or to deliver their mm -hmm. product uh, to prepare students and that's how we started the foundation program mm -hmm. at Oxbridge. So we mm -hmm. now moved from Cambridge A levels mm -hmm. to partnering with somebody who can recruit or help with progression to destinations for the students to partnering with somebody else for a second delivery, another stream pathway for the college. And that's how slowly and steadily, and that's why I say the staying power is important. Mm -hmm. And to be able to support this staying power, keep looking for areas, new areas that you can tap into, to mm -hmm. introduce into the business. I get bored easily. Mm -hmm. So it's when something new starts, again, yeah. I wake up, mm -hmm. I'm all excited, I pursue that. So the NCUK came on board, then we started the American pathway also, 
partnered with another body in Nigeria who is able to deliver, prepare students who are now interested in studying in America. Because we were getting the feedback that our focus is UK. Mm. And then I like challenges, like okay. I said. No, our focus is not only UK. Mm -hmm. We can do America, we can do Canada. Mm. Today, we can even send students to Australia. Wow. So you Amazing. need to keep researching into your market segment mm. to see areas really outside Nigeria mm -hmm. so that you can bring whatever is available mm -hmm. to the um, whatever it is you are doing in Nigeria, which you are also doing yes. anyway. <laughs> Thank well you. Done. Thank you so much. I think one of the things that I really could relate to with what you said is getting bored. Um, sometimes I find myself getting bored as well because it's almost like you're in a it becomes a routine you know it's the same thing every day and you know sometimes when you have the financial goals and you're just looking at the numbers you forget about some of the other important things as well so how i mean it's been 26 years how mm. have you been able to combat the boredom and how i mean without having new things coming up how have you been able to you know just stay the course and and not get or fight the boredom if if that's I find the bottom okay. through attending conferences, um, you know, and participating in other areas outside mm -hmm. of Oxbridge. Mm -hmm. It's not only Oxbridge that makes me tick, mm -hmm. as I always say. I am involved with AFEN, the Association of Private Educators in Nigeria, okay. was one of the founding founders oh, wow. of Amazing. AFEN. So, you know, again, we moved out of our own comfort zone in mm -hmm. our respective schools to see mm -hmm. how we could influence other schools mm -hmm. and start being mentors mm -hmm. to the up and coming like you. Okay. So I was involved with APEN, chairmanship of a, co a couple of, uh, first it was the Bobby College, a boys school, oh, wow. everybody was surprised. <laughs> um, chairmanship of the Lagos Anglican mm -hmm. um, schools, okay. generally for the Anglican schools, and there were about five schools run by the Anglican Community Schools. So, you know, all of those areas also are areas, I, and all this is pro bono, okay. you know, and mm -hmm. you know, it just keeps up the interest because at Oxbridge I have a head of school, yeah. therefore my involvement is not 100% hands on, yeah. and therefore I'm able to participate in other things. And then we opened another branch which we'd been contemplating for mm -hmm. a while. In fact, in the past, I traveled to Ghana, to South Africa, looking for places where we mm -hmm. could open Abuja, various mm -hmm. considerations, mm -hmm. but we landed at Lekki. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you have also, you said it yes. as part of what you yeah. plan to do to start yeah. opening. You'll yeah. find that once I a, a branch is properly established, mm -hmm. you have your systems in yeah. place your policies in place, mm -hmm. it's easier to transfer yeah. to the same another thing, yeah. uh, area. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's go back to the journey. Um, I think you've come to a point now where you have the freedom of getting involved in a lot of other extracurricular activities because like you said, you've set the structure down in place. So before this time, what challenges did you face in getting to the point where you can now you know be involved in so many other things mm. okay. I think like I said earlier the main challenge is the human capacity mm. to ensure that people understand their roles mm -hmm. they understand the expectations of the programs that we run here mm -hmm. um, to also be able to reach because um, you know, in Nigeria, we have the bandwagon effect. You've started something, you'll yes. soon get to understand. Yes. Other people say, oh, it's doing well. Mm -hmm. Look at me too, I can start. So now you have other sixth form colleges. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we now needed to be more aggressive with the marketing. So we had to set up a marketing unit. So we have actually have a viable uh, marketing unit that, mm -hmm. um, for Oxbridge mm -hmm. as well. So these are all the areas in which we had the challenges but really the human capacity development is mm -hmm. the main area so that people understand their roles and to be able to handle that i brought in expatriate heads uh, you know over uh -huh. a period of about 10 years uh -huh. who also were able to then instill uh -huh. the ethics into the members of staff here at oxbridge so it's not business as usual it's time, not time, Nigerian time. Mm -hmm. It's time, it's time, mm -hmm. and all of that. So that's how we were able to um, handle the challenges in growing up. 
So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, schools are not allowed to market directly. Am I? I don't know if that's true. Oh, like, you can. okay, you can. Okay. I think it's accountants and um, I think lawyers. lawyers. Yeah. Okay. So how how has has your marketing evolved from um, newspapers to what you guys do today in terms of marketing? Right. The thing with marketing is that uh, we did a lot of training. We had marketers come to train us okay. as to the best ways to market a school. Mm -hmm. If you're in Lagos, if you don't have the boarding house, there's no point putting advertisements mm -hmm. in newspaper mm -hmm. that will go to Kaduna yeah. <laughs> or Abuja. Yeah. Because if the students are interested in coming, mm -hmm. you're not able to accommodate yeah. them. And therefore, we learned along the way how to market efficiently and mm -hmm. smartly. Mm -hmm. It's smart marketing that's mm -hmm. important. And slowly and steadily, borrowing from, you know, I, I learn from everybody. I say mm -hmm. I learn from my kids, mm -hmm. from their experience being in the UK mm -hmm. as well. How, what suggestions from them? And what did you, what were, were the aspects that were done in your school? So things like taste experience. Mm -hmm. So we knew we could go into schools, invite them to come mm -hmm. and have a taste experience of Foxbridge. Mm -hmm. That is, they come into Oxbridge for the whole day. They have they attend classes. They have lunch with the students. Um, so they have a feel of what Oxbridge feels like, and therefore slowly and steadily develop relationships with feeder schools, what we call feeder schools. So all of this emerged from uh, the marketing um, the development of the marketing team and having conversations, having trainings, going mm. abroad for trainings and all of that. I, I think that's great. Um, but now, I, as you know, social yes. media is Yes, social media is, yeah. yeah, social Instagram, media is powerful. Instagram, yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, so how, I mean, we've spoken a lot about Oxbridge, we've spoken a lot about your journey, but how have you grown as a person? So how have you grown as as an entrepreneur, as a woman, from 1993 till, till now, till date? Um, as I said, I love challenges. Um, I love trainings. I love reading. So my growth really has been around those areas, from reading, mm -hmm. from attending. I love going for seminars, conferences mm -hmm. abroad, seminars within Nigeria, in all aspects, not just mm -hmm. education. Uh, growing yourself as an individual, the things that you need to do, emotional intelligence, um, whatever it is, you know, any opportunities I have, I uh, attend those seminars. And then being involved with other schools, other sectors, participating in the other things, I say wherever one is, you must yeah. always learn something. Yeah. I always tell people, I run a sixth form college, but if I visit a primary school, I must be able to learn something, something yeah. from that school. And when you attend conferences, when we organize conferences, when we attend conferences abroad, we do school visits. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, a lot of uh, the introduction, mm -hmm. um, um, quotations mm -hmm. or quotes on the walls mm -hmm. and all of that, we see from schools. Mm -hmm. And I have then developed a passion, yeah. for example, for quotes, mm -hmm. because they are short stories that can direct your tra uh, trajectory mm -hmm. and your journey through life. So, you know, I have learned a lot from various kinds of exposure. Yeah. I love that. I think it's very wise to pick out the best everywhere you go. A lot of times as young entrepreneurs, we want to be the first and only person to have done this and we want to be unique, you know. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in being able to see something that works and adopting it. So mm. I, I've definitely learned that today. Mm. So thank I you so much. I think this is mindfulness. Yes. Be aware of yes. the environment. Exactly, you exactly. There's exactly. something always to learn. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the education system or should I say sector in Nigeria because the whole premise of your business is to train children to school outside of the country oh, and within the country okay within the country as well okay so they can they can study um, sixth form and then you go to it. year two okay year two okay that's year, amazing Nigerian that's amazing University. but majority of the of the, your students end up outside the country okay so what are your views on the current education system in Nigeria needs a lot of work. Mm. It needs a lot of work, a lot of revamping, 
a lot of um, focus as well and a lot of um, support from the government because um, private schools for example form about 80 percent of schools in Lagos State. Wow. Uh, if there are 20,000 schools, about 18,000 are private schools. Wow. And then, of course, you have the different categories of mm -hmm. private schools uh, in the state. So what we do, for example, in our own uh, association, mm -hmm. is how we can develop ourselves, train ourselves. And our motto is that quality education should be available, available to all Nigerian children. So we even adopt schools in our locality mm -hmm that we can support as well. Train their teachers, our students go in there, read books to them and everything. So the quality of education is what we need to look into. Mm -hmm. But in looking into the quality of education, you must start with the training, the quality yeah. of the teachers. Mm -hmm. A lot of the teachers find themselves in teaching by default, mm -hmm. not necessarily by passion, mm -hmm. the way it was in the past, not necessarily because that's what they wanted to do, but maybe they apply and they can't get into their first choice and find themselves, teaching might not have even featured yeah. amongst their choices and they find themselves there. So we need first and foremost to pay attention. The government needs to realize that without education, the change we are striving for Some will be more. elusive. Yeah. And therefore, education is what we need. And we visit other countries, we see what's happened in Korea, mm -hmm. in Singapore, places like that. That it's purely through education that the government has been able to evolve to where they are today. And the level of illiteracy in Nigeria is so high yeah. that even neighboring countries are not in the bad space we are mm -hmm. in Nigeria with our education. So the government needs to because the private sector alone cannot do it. Mm -hmm. If we are catering the population in Lagos, let's say 20 million children, mm -hmm. and we are only catering to maybe 2,000, well. there is still a large chunk mm -hmm. that's not being well catered for, well looked after, mm -hmm. with policy, effective, efficient policy formulations, mm -hmm. seeing how teachers can be in, um, are trained to be classroom ready. Mm -hmm to be able to help the children, improving facilities mm -hmm. in the respective schools to ensure that the children actually go there and learning and teaching is taking place. It's um, very sad because I grew up in a Nigeria where there mm -hmm. was quality education. Yeah. And a lot of the schools then were government schools. Mm -hmm. Private, I lived in Ibadan. Children's Home School was the only private school wow. in Ibadan. All of us, we all went to Awilowo school. Oh. Yes, in those days. And we still had the mm -hmm. exposure to good quality teaching yeah. and learning. Yeah. So we need to go back to that space in our education sector. Mm -hmm. The government needs to not just witch hunt the private schools, but partner with them mm -hmm. and see how we can work together because we are willing to. We have a good success rate in Lagos State, I must okay. confess. Okay. We work um, effectively with the Lagos State Ministry of Education. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. And therefore, we are able to um, participate in policy formulation, mm -hmm. uh, development of the calendar, and amazing. everything. But at the federal level, something needs to happen mm. seriously mm. and very soon, too. Mm. Maybe start by. Um, nominating or selecting mm -hmm. or what is it now <laughs> an, effective, yeah. an effective appointing mm -hmm. an effective competent minister for education mm. who even understands what our challenges are mm -hmm. and therefore one baby step at a time will be able to address these challenges so that slowly and steadily the quality education we had in nigeria in times past can gradually be restored because without education, like I keep saying to my colleagues in the education sector, mm -hmm. we're not going anywhere. Yeah. And we must address value-based education. Okay. We must look at things like research and development okay. in the education sector with the tertiary um, institution to cascade back into the system to develop. There is need for 
a, a complete overhaul yeah. of the education system. I completely system. agree. I mean, if you look at schools in China, I mean, they're coding as early as primary school, and I mean, that's not even something that's even on the table for us it's over on here. The so table. It's because <laughs> they started with coding, they oh, wanted really? to introduce coding into schools and mm. everything. But you've got to have the infrastructure that will support yeah. all of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And are the students, how are they doing with other subjects? Coding is not the only thing. It's mm. got to be a holistic definitely. approach to everything. Definitely. So are there specific policies that um, an entrepreneur that wants to come into this sector should be aware of, government policies that they need to bear in mind before starting um, a school? Um, with the government policies, um, the quality of whatever it is one wants to de uh, mm -hmm. deliver is important. Yeah. Um, approval mm -hmm. is one of the key aspects from the Ministry of Education. You need to go to the Ministry of Education to go to the sector that's responsible for approvals because you've got to have your space, the building, they've mm -hmm. got to come and inspect it, mm -hmm. approve that the space is um, suitable yeah. for whatever level of education you want to do and um, you've got to actually go to the Ministry of Education and look into all aspects and ensure that you are arrival ready by the time it's time to start your school. So um, let's go back a little bit to Oxbridge. What has been, if you had to classify your all-time high so far on your journey, what, what, what would that be? My student success. Oh, the student success, not only when they are at Oxbridge, but post Oxbridge. Mm. I am always so excited when I come across them and I see how they are flourishing mm. in this uh, uh, workspace. Uh, the degrees they finish with, a mm. lot of our students have are graduated with first class wow. in universities abroad. Mm -hmm. And we find opportunities of celebrating. We have a strong alumni association. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when I meet all of them and mm -hmm. I see them and I see where they're working, the mm -hmm. ones who are doctors, the ones who have started their own businesses, mm -hmm. set up their own businesses. Okay, Phil is one of our. Uh, okay, Ophil is one of our former students, yeah. and he's in that book space mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. and doing a lot of amazing yeah. things. Uh, those are the things that I say for us educators mm. are the rewards. Mm. And I always tell them when they are leaving, I'm waiting to see you at the top. May God spare my yes, life to yeah. see you yeah. at the top, doing so well yes. and making uh, a difference in whichever sector. We always encourage them, wherever you go, make a difference. And making a difference in those sectors. Those are the highs for me. Yeah. And those are the things that give me a lot of pleasure. That's great. So it's been 26 amazing years. You have a thriving business. You've grown exponentially. You have students that are making you proud around the world. What's next? What's, what's left? What's next for you, for Oxbridge? What's on the table? Uh, for Oxbridge is for us to have additional campuses. Mm -hmm. That would be the vision for Oxbridge to grow so that what we have on offer will be available to more people within and even outside Nigeria. Ghana is still an option. Uh, for me as an individual, it's giving back really. I tell mm -hmm. my students, I tell my staff, I'm not waking up to mm -hmm. come and count the Naira and Cobra at Oxbridge, <laughs> but really to see how I can impact on mm -hmm. the lives of the students who are passing through mm -hmm. Oxbridge, to build resilience in them, to build their self-confidence. So those are things we are bringing on board now at Oxbridge uh, as part of our core values. How do we prepare them mm -hmm. so they arrive ready at university and they're able to have the coping mechanisms that will make them succeed? Yes, they've been succeeding, but we want to in increase the percentage of those of them who are going Eventually, out, yeah. graduating with fourth class mm -hmm. degrees and Amazing. being ready for the workspace. Let me ask you a question. Okay. I know you started a, um, a space called the Play Place. Yes. What informs that decision? So I have four siblings, there are five of us, and my younger siblings are still teenagers. And growing, we grew up in Chicago actually. And I remember going to the Children's Museum with my mom. I remember doing so many fun activities. And for my younger siblings who grew up here, I just found that there was, there was nothing of that sort currently. 
and i just wanted to create that experience for them even though now they're old and they <laughs> they can't be bothered with it but i really wanted to create um you know the experience that i had as a child uh, growing up of just being able to play in a fun environment and uh, yeah so i think that was that was the reason why i decided to start play place good and yeah. i'm sure you came and it wasn't a bed of roses starting off play place so no. what were your challenges i faced so many challenges first of all um the type of business that i have is very um heavy on infrastructure mm. and infrastructure is expensive so mm. funding funding um staff finding the right people because when you have children it's very very i'm sure you and you know that it's very very um sensitive so especially young children so i had to make sure that i was hiring the right people and I found that it wasn't so much about the salary, but I found that it wasn't a prestigious or it isn't classified as a prestigious job. So those who are really qualified to do the job feel that it's beneath them. So finding the right people who really understand what we are trying to do at Play Place, I think was one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. Right. So finding students, finding the right people. Yes. How did you find students? How did you find the right people? Um, so they're not necessarily students. I'm they they come in, yeah, they come in with their family. Them. Yes. So I, I just found that parents are actually looking for somewhere to take their children to. So once we opened up, it was just like you know, it was like a whirlwind of customers coming in, and then from I realized, the neighborhood. yes, from the neighborhood and even outside the neighborhood sometimes okay. on the mainland. Like we have a lot of people coming in from all over the mainland, and yeah, so that kind of sorted itself out. And then for the for the staff, like you said, we've we've just had to do a lot of training, like a lot of. But where did training. you get them from initially? Um, so they were through agents. Yes, from it. agencies initially, um, from the social from social media um, campaigns, people around the area as well, young, vibrant, you know, people that are willing to learn, and yeah, those I think those three have been the biggest. What so about um? Furnishing, for example, furnishing the place. Luckily, did you have to bring in a lot of your stuff? Yes, yeah, I had to. Um, luckily, my mom is an interior decorator, oh, so it was kind of her forte. Yes, so <laughs> she was able to help. We had to source a lot of our um, infrastructure from out of the country, and they had to come in and build. That took time as well. It was also very expensive, mm. but um, luckily, I had the support of my family, so everybody chipped in, and we were able to to set it up. Fantastic. Yes. And I presume finance also came from the family. Yes, yes, yes. It's it nice did. to have a family yes, support. Yes, yes, it is. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I would like to end with your favorite quote, if you don't um, mind. <laughs> my favorite quote is actually up there. Okay. It does not matter what car you drove today. Mm. It does not matter which house you built today. Mm -hmm. It does not matter how much money you collect mm. today. What matters? is the impact you have had in the lives of those who have come across you on your life's journey. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Guzaya, for your Thank time. You. It's, it's been, been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. You. Thank you. I'm and grateful. I wish you the very best of success Thank with your you. new business. Thank you so it's much. three years. Yes. It will go to 26 years. And Amen. I can assure you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing all the other branches yes. all over Lagos. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you for watching this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. This interview was recorded on the 15th of August 2019 at Oxbridge Tutorial College, Ikeja, Lagos. We look forward to hearing about your feedback and aha moments in the comment section below. Remember to join the live conversations right after this premiere. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get further notifications when a new episode drops and definitely join us next week Friday for a new episode. Thank you.